Hey, race fans, welcome to another episode of Backseat Drivers. We're back in the pickup truck because I have the whole crew here again. We have Kim Coon, Jonathan Merriman, Danny B, and Eric. All right, guys, Talladega, typical chaos. But if you would have asked me if we would have gone into three overtimes, I don't know if I could have told you that. Uh, Casey, what do you think of the race? I thought it was action-packed. I think that's probably the most wrecks I remember seeing at Talladega in a very long time. Lots of carnage, but kind of the same old players when it comes to super speedways. I was so disappointed Matt Benedetto did not get his first win, and then his post-race interview was a heartbreaker. But all in all, thought it was a great race, and Denny Hamlin back on top. Look, when you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with, with these guys who have done this week in and week out and been in the good equipment for a long time, um, you know, you can almost, you know, rather be lucky than good, but, you know, Denny Hamlin's just flat out good at these racetracks and he proved it. I thought it was a great race. I was entertain entertained the entire time, uh, you know, from the jump, you know, you had that, that little incident early in the race all the way to the three overtimes. Uh, it was action packed. I uh, didn't think it was ever going to end, but having said that there's a lot of highlights coming out of that race and I guarantee you fans are going to be itching to get back to Talladega uh, once we can go full capacity. Yeah, we should have known with those three cautions before we even got to the uh, to the competition yellow that we were going to be in for for a wild and a, and a slugfest more or less. But I agree with everything you guys said. It was an edge of your seat race for all four and a half hours that it lasted, and uh, I thought it was great. I think it was great to see fans back in the stands. You could really hear the fans, and uh, that was kind of a, a small return to uh, Talladega normalcy. I thought. Well, I had the pleasure of being one of those fans in attendance yesterday, and. Uh, after the first caution, I looked over at one of my friends who was with me, and I said, it's going to be one of those Talladega races. And sure enough, it was one of those Talladega races. Definitely probably the wildest race that I've seen in person in Talladega. And I guess when I was walking out of there, I just felt like there was so much emotions that I couldn't really uh, compose really leaving there. It felt like a combination of me being at the Bristol Night Race in 2019, as well as being at Daytona in uh, 2020 earlier this year uh, for a truck series more specific when Jordan Anderson lost out the Grand Anfinger. It was like a combination of both of those feelings really. Yeah it was a good one. Uh, Merriman I want to start with you though. Was there a move of the race that stuck out to you the most? Denny Hamlin dropping to the back. I mean I, I was wrong on this show last week and said you got to stay up front if you want to finish up front and look he knew I think from the jump you know, Denny's really good at sensing that. And Denny knew it was going to get wild, and he knew track position that early didn't matter. He knew the points didn't matter. So, look, he bailed out on it. He pulled the parachute, went to the back of the pack, and I think that, you know, that race car he finished with looked pretty perfect to me. So, um, I think that was probably the move of the race. It wasn't anybody dodging anything or doing anything crazy, but um, just having the, the – the vision to see what was going to end up happening and bailing out to the back paid off for him. Yeah. Driving Miss Daisy, the sequel will feature Denny Hamlin uh, and Chris Gavehart. Uh, Casey, what about you? I'm with Merriman. Really, there weren't any moves of the race in terms of dodging any of the carnage. Usually we watch a super speedway race and we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he made it through, you know, that big one. We didn't see that on Sunday. Pretty much if you were near the wreck, you were in the wreck. So I have to agree, Denny Hamlin just kind of playing it safe, laying low for the race was the move of the race for me. But some of the names, too, that ended up in the top 10 or top 15, I thought uh, were some – surprises I had some eyebrow raised you know the likes of John Hunter Nemechek Brennan Poole Justin Haley Quinn House Timmy Hill getting top 10 slash top 10 15 finishes um to me was interesting and and good for some of those smaller teams yeah I think for move of the race for me honestly it was maybe a, a bad move I think you can't win the race on lap one dropping to the back but coming out of turn four when Matt DiBenedetto uh, seemed like it was going to be between him and William Byron for the win and uh, when he moved down and, and made contact with the 24 car and that got both of them squirrely and that kind of opened the door for for Hamlin for Jones for some of those other guys to swoop in on the front stretch I thought you know ultimately that was the move of the race but maybe not it, what maybe wasn't a positive highlight it was really a mistake that kind of opened the door for Hamlin to, to swoop in and steal the victory Move the race for me. I'm going to give it to the 88 team pit crew, not really to Alex Bowman, but to his pit crew. Because the what the incident happened with him and Almirola, that's something that would have ended anyone else's playoff chances. But they persevered and they was able to get him into the pits. Like I, like every caution there was, I would see the 88 coming through the pits like you know once every lap, and he'd always beat the pace car out. So they stayed on the lead lap by doing that. But they got as much of it fixed as they could. 
and was able to just, you know, keep him in the back from the rest of the carnage that happened the rest of the day, and he come home 14th. 16 or 17 times, I think, is he was on pit road. So, yeah, and he extended his uh, points lead uh, on what he had coming into this. He was eight, probably like, well, only in the teens, and now he's up to 22 points ahead. Yeah, tape is not Denny Hamlin's friend, but it is definitely Alex Bowman's friend. Uh, we saw his whole front of his car was nothing but tape. Um, okay, so now playoffs, cut line. We have four guys who are heading to the Roval who are probably not going to sleep a whole lot this week. Uh, looking at those top eight, however, are you worried about the bottom four? I'm looking at maybe Kyle Busch, Marion. Yeah, I mean, look, any of those guys are going to have to win. You're not going to point your way out out of the out of the Roval, that's for sure. Unless it's going to take a bad day for for Logano and Bowman for for Kyle Busch maybe to point his way out, but I just don't see it happening. Everybody knows what they have on the line. I think they'll be conservative. I don't think they'll short pit. They'll stay out, get those stage points, um, and just further build those leads. So um, you know, it's he's got to win the race. You know, you can't really go in there and, and race, you know, two or three guys and try to outpoint them, any of those guys. But um, we've seen, you know, Austin Dillon and, and, and his crew chief, Justin Alexander, swing for the fence before. You know, they won a Coke 600 a couple years ago doing that. So um, I think it's going to take something like that, something weird, something wacky for, for them to advance. Even post-race yesterday said that he wasn't wrong about that. So he is still – in that mindset. Uh, Danny V, what about you? I think it could be interesting between Bush and Logano. Like, if Logano has a bad day, that's really going to be Kyle Bush's best chance. But I hate to bring this up from last year and use this term. I've never seen a NASCAR driver rage quit a race before. But that's essentially what Kyle Bush did at the Roval last year. So, you know, not going to be one of his favorites, I'm sure. I'm sure if Kyle Busch had the opportunity, he might have rage quit this round of the playoffs already. <laughs> but uh, I, I agree. I do think it's going to be very difficult for anyone outside the top eight to point their way in. Uh, that being said, this is the first Charlotte Roval race that's going to be run without any practice beforehand. And there's maybe, you never know, there's the threat of weather possibly uh, threatening Saturday and Sunday afternoon. So this could be the biggest wild card race uh, of the three Rovals to this point. But I still don't feel great about Kyle Busch's chances I don't think he has a top 30 at the Roval yet so uh, it's going to be difficult but watch out behind him guys like Clint Boyer not too shabby of road course racers he could surprise some people and if Logano or Elliott or, or Bowman surprisingly if one of those guys surprisingly runs into issues early on and maybe gets caught up in somebody else's mess on a restart uh, that could very much open the door for a guy like Austin Dillon Austin Dillon's had so much speed in these playoffs it would be a shame for uh, for the him to go out the way he has these last two weeks so that's a guy I'll be watching to really pull off an upset Sunday I hope it rains in Charlotte. I just plant a grass seed in. I'd like to see it, uh, see the race run in the wet. So there you go. Win-win yeah. win for me. Yeah, Kyle Busch might have rage quit all of 2020 if he could. And also, I will be wearing uh, all of my rain good luck charms and doing a rain dance come Saturday because I'm not driving in it. So I want to see some windshield wipers uh, at the Roval. Okay, we're going to play a little bit of a game here to finish out this episode Kind of game day style, we're going to do some picks. So I'm going to throw out two options. Uh, you say your pick and why. So let's do the winner of the race. If I were to say either Chase Elliott or Martin Truex Jr., Kim, who you got? I think both of them have proven themselves on road courses slash rovals, but I'm going to go with Chase Elliott. This year he's been so strong and obviously a former winner at the Roval. MTJ, yes, he's run well at Charlotte, but I think in terms of – the numbers and strength that Chase Elliott comes up on top. Merriman, you had your pick locked in like nine weeks ago, so let's hear it. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to pick Chase, and it's, you know, obviously he's Chase Elliott. He's really good at road courses, but I think the missing piece for Truex there is Cole Pern, so I'm going to go with the nine. All right, Eric. I'll, I'll go I'll go the other way for this one. You know, I love Chase Elliott, but Martin Truex Jr., I, I mean, he kind of got that win in 2018 taken away from him at the Roval. I say maybe he's looking at a shot at redemption this year. So I, I'll go Martin Truex Jr. I think he – can we say it's an upset? I think if anyone wins besides Chase, it might be an upset. Danny B. I would definitely say Chase Elliott. If you, you put these two up to, against each other at Watkins Glen two years in a row, Chase Elliott got them both times, and Chase Elliott right now – is the king of road courses in NASCAR, in my opinion. So definitely give it to Chase Elliott. All right, I'm going to throw a little bit on uh, Team Eric over there and add some weight to the Martin Truex Jr. side. I'm going with the 19. Uh, all right, next up is the highest finish of the race, Keselowski or Logano. Cam, lead us off. I'm going to go with Logano. I don't know what really is pulling me in that direction. I just feel, um, have a sense that Brad Keselowski might run into some bad luck. So going with Logano and 
Nothing else than just a gut feeling. I'm going with Kozlowski because Kim's wrong. <laughs> I'll go Brad Keselowski just because I, I feel like he is – he's a veteran. He's got that kind of experience. I feel like he's going to know how to avoid the, avoid the big mistake. I think after 2018, he's going to be on pins and needles making sure he doesn't make the same mistake again. So, I'll go Brad. I'm going to go Logano just because I think Lightning can strike twice, and I always remember Brad Keselowski running it off into Tom's heartburn turn. <laughs> Hard to forget. Yeah, and because I am always team anti-Merriman and team Kim – I'm going to go with Logano. Uh, okay, next one, we're going to do a top five finish. Which of these two drivers gets it done, Kevin Harvick or Alex Bowman? Casey? I'm going to say both. I don't know that if that's allowed, but sure. both of them, I think, end up with a top five finish. Alex Bowman's got two top five there. Harvick's got one top five, one top ten. I think it's just going to be um, where we see them both get a top five. I'm going to take Bowman. I think uh, I think his drive at the end of that race last year was one of the most impressive things I've seen in a long time. So I'm going to take Bowman. Yeah, I'll go Bowman as well. Hendrick was super fast last year with Chase Elliott, and and like you said, Bowman making a charge late. It's it's you know every other track this year I probably would go Harvick, but not the Roval. I think this is Bowman's shot. Y'all even have to ask me. Average finish of third. Team eighty eight, baby. Bowman. <laughs> Everybody counting out for Kevin Harvick. <laughs> First time um, for everything. Have- yeah, I'm going to add to the Team 88 here. I'm going with Alex Bowman. Um, okay, two more on here. Let's do the first to lock into the round of eight on points. Uh, is it going to be another Joe Gibbs driver or a driver from Team Penske? Casey? I'm going to go Team Penske. And I just think that's because we've seen a, a tad bit more strength from them. And if we're looking at the JGR drivers, Denny Hamlin has been the standout over there. He's already locked himself in. So I'm looking at... Joey Logano and Brad Keselowski. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to the end of the race because I think as it sits right now, what do you have to have a full race is what, 60, 70 points? So I don't think any of them can do it by stage wins. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to go Truex simply because I think he's going to, you know, have probably eight points in each stage and probably outplace Keselowski by five or six positions. So I think he could probably lock in on points uh, ahead of of Keselowski. Yeah, if we look at the yeah, best, right if we look at the best road course racer for uh, across all those teams, I think it is Martin Truex Jr. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on on this one. Same for me. I'm going to Martin Truex Jr. and Joe Gibbs Racing in this case. He's definitely proven he knows how to contend for wins at the Roval and do well on road courses. All right, uh, I'm going to go Team Penske just to shake it up and be with Kim again. Uh, okay, last one. First out, uh, this is going off of points. Is it going to be 83, Austin Dillon, Andy Three Camp, or Eric Amarola? Kim? I'm going to go Eric Amarola. He's down there at the bottom of the barrel, minus 48 points. Uh, Austin Dillon just minus 21. That, to me, is relatively a significant difference. Um, Eric doesn't stand out to me as a guy that really knows his way around road courses. Austin has been so fast and had so much strength and speed lately, not to say that he's a great road course racer, but their team has certainly put together some great races. So I think Eric is out first. Yeah. I'm I'm with Kim on that. Um, I don't know a snowball's chance and you know where of making it out of there. But look, it is possible. Anything can happen. You know, everybody could wreck on lap one and he could be the only one left out on the racetrack. It's the Roval. Uh, but it's Almirola has got his work cut out for him. Yeah. He's, he's certainly going to be behind the eight ball early, but he does have a Stuart Haas racing Ford underneath him. So I, I will never count him out entirely, but uh, I do think Austin Dillon's going to be driving with a bit more of a, a chip on his shoulder, a bit more to prove he stood out in these playoffs really emerged and, and kind of grabbed everyone's attention the last few weeks. And I think he's, he's not going to go down without a, without swinging. I'm going to get, I'm going to go with uh, Eric Amarillo in this case. I think he's, you know, like everyone else has said, he's got the biggest hole on him right now and I can't, recall him being particularly great in the first two rubble races here so yeah eric amarola yeah the 10 car minus 48 wolf i don't know how you recover from that first one out eric amarola uh, eric i did not see the halloween lights i like the decorations friend <laughs> oh yeah uh, I, I guess i just forgot to dust in here that's what happens when you're not on the show for a few weeks so just kind of spiraled out of control over here <laughs> i like it um, all right, Danny B and Eric, thank you guys for joining the crew here on Maxi Drivers. Uh, enjoy the Roval. It's going to be an exciting Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern on NBC. Enjoy the Charlotte Roval. We'll see you guys right back here on another episode of Maxi Drivers.